in, in the previous talks. Um, they covered the uh, concept and also uh, why did we uh, implement it um, you know, as a platform uh, vendor. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk uh, to you more about uh, some of the practical challenges that uh, you have experienced uh, based on my experience working with uh, some of you all. Um, and, and why do you need smart endpoints uh, and why do you need integration microservices for that, what we can offer uh, to solve specific problems. So this talk is new though, the slides, um, if you have been to our previous summits, you will, you will uh, find them to be the, the same slides, but uh, the, I'm not going to talk much about the slides themselves, but about some of my practical experiences here. Okay, so uh, rise of microservices. I think um, if you haven't heard about the microservices these days, and if you're doing enterprise integration, <laughs> Um, uh, I think you should go and, go and read up on it. Uh, there is, there's plenty on the internet. There are useful books that people have written. Uh, some of my uh, colleagues have also uh, written some books about microservices, their importance and things like this. So what changed um, when microservices came into play in the enterprise integration space is very much that uh, monolithic uh, legacy enterprise service bus sort of a pattern went away and got replaced with something that we call smart endpoints and uh, dumb pipes. So if you, if you consider the previous pattern that, that um, some of you may be familiar with, uh, if you started off your integration journey much earlier, you used to have um, an enterprise service bus, which is pretty much the central um, hub. And uh, you had the spokes which were connecting uh, into various systems, which can be applications and services that you have internally, data sources uh, or other enterprise um, infrastructure and so on and so forth, right? So, and, and, and this pattern was quite, quite straightforward to use because um, you, you can have any amount of systems, the uh, enterprise service bus vendors used to provide connectors for these things or uh, very easy to use uh, capabilities like transformations, uh, enterprise integration patterns and all of that. Now, in the smart endpoint and dumb pipes world, um, this kind of pattern got replaced. So um, we have now a series of microservices. We have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, like systems that are fronted by these microservices. You find um, other layers uh, that are being introduced to integrate microservices and so on and so forth uh, in this ecosystem, because you still need to do all of the routing, the transformation, uh, you might want to do uh, conversions from, you know, one payload format to another format because the two systems are based on two standards and so on and so forth. And there are lots of challenges. Now, for anyone wondering what's a smart endpoint and what's a dumb pipe. Uh, so the ESB uh, that we had in the past more or less was like a, a, a smart uh, uh, plumbing system. So um, the, we didn't have a scenario of a dumb pipe there, the ESB was smart, so it could achieve that. But without the ESB, all of these uh, little arrows that you see in the slides um, um, here uh, don't have any meaning. You know, like uh, there is no control over them, so you, you connect system A to system B, and um, it's, it's down to the individual microservices, so these individual elements, uh, the square, the, the uh, rectangles that you see here, um, to be smart about what they do. So this is this uh, new normal in terms of integration that we are seeing uh, when uh, uh, microservices came into play. But still, an uh, important thing to note is integration never went away. Uh, it's, it's still around. It is just that the way we did integration changed uh, in the last uh, five years or even a little more than five years or so, and it has evolved a lot now. So integrating microservices is not easy. Like, so, we, we find, um, uh, I think, uh, enterprises of various sorts. There are the uh, greenfield ones, you know, like the, the ones that, that came up with the, the boom of the internet, more or less, or, or a little later. Uh, that had the opportunity to do all of the cool things that they call like uh, Netflix, even Uber, for instance. These, these never existed uh, beyond a certain point. Uh, but, but then you also have large enterprises that have been running for maybe 50 years, 60 years, even more than that, 30 years, 20 years, so and so forth. And then they have a lot of uh, 
sort of uh, infrastructure uh, that they have to maintain, which are not based on uh, these kinds of, uh, um, you know, capabilities and then so and so forth. Uh, so you need to sort of uh, manage uh, the transition between your proprietary, uh, I don't know, the uh, historical components that you have within your business uh, um, infrastructure. And, and these new sort of microservices, these new trends, the new requirements that you have from new projects and so on and so forth, right? So this is the second type. And then you have like a third category, you know, like there are people who um, have very niche requirements. They may have an enterprise landscape, but they just wanted to get one service out of the door sort of thing. And you can still afford to operate like, um, you know, like a very new, like a startup sort of a, ecosystem just to get that service out. And then we, we find those uh, sort of enterprises as well uh, because uh, they, they also have a proper use case there. So now for the first category, uh, which was completely greenfield and also the third category, which has a very specific niche requirement which, which can straight be done, you, you really have many options out there. But majority, unfortunately, are in the second category. You have an enterprise landscape. You also want to do microservices. And, and you want to make use of it uh, at the same time. So now this, uh, the, the, the slide has a graphic from Uber, uh, which was um, uh, from around two years ago. Um, they, they, they got this done using Jaeger, their, their tracing system, um, uh, to, to just show the sheer complexity of the microservices that they have. I think right now, the latest uh, from Uber, I think from a couple of months ago, said that they have around 2,200 microservices. I think they probably have more than that uh, as we speak, uh, but it's, it's such a lot. And, and when you have such a lot of microservices, uh, you, and, and, and you obviously understand that they need to integrate as well. They, they would be serving certain parts of the business. Um, there, there is a lot of requirement uh, to, uh, you, you know, so, sort of, integrate this uh, to achieve, you know, like cross-functional requirements in the business and so and so forth. So this, this is a very, very complex problem, you know, like the problem that was almost solved previously uh, with an ESB before someone came and said, you know, there's a new thing called microservices and then everyone went, hey, let's do that. And uh, now, now we are almost back at the same place. So now how can you solve this kind of thing? Uh, one solution that was proposed um, is to use something that is called a service mesh. Uh, the service mesh organizes things very well. Um, it's, 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 it's not a distributed DSV, interestingly, but, but um, it, it still has the constructs of, of what um, sort of like a integration ecosystem needs to be, but it lacks a lot. For example, um, a service mesh allows you to have sort of a control plane, which can control these uh, dumb uh, channels that integrate with uh, uh, various microservices. Um, you can segregate functionality into sidecars. So for example, if you want to have a security component or if you want to have an API gateway or something like that, that can be placed in a sidecar, very straightforward. So you can decouple uh, these kinds of um, functionality from your microservice. But however, you cannot compose services together. Like say you have microservices uh, Y here, the two of them, and you want to aggregate that into a new microservice X, you have to sort of build the composition logic into your microservice X. Uh, a service mesh does not offer uh, an integration solution there. So the control plane merely handles the routing or sort of the interconnection of systems. When it comes to integration, where you have various other patterns, you cannot really achieve it with a service mesh. Um, and, and, and then even beyond that, uh, people, people want to do um, composition and aggregation in, you know, like cloud native fashion. They want to connect with API gateways and so and so forth. So the challenge of service mesh even goes further um, uh, because there is still no proper solution uh, if not for um, something uh, beyond this uh, kind of ecosystem. Okay, so now let's have a look at how to actually uh, build, you know, not um, uh, sort of smart uh, ecosystems, but, but uh, so, sort of how to use an integration microservice coming from an integration, you know, uh, uh, sort of a platform uh, to build these smart endpoints. So one of the um, 
architectures, again, that I'm, I'm quoting an, another example from Uber here, is to use something uh, uh, which is sort of like a domain-oriented uh, uh, architecture. Uh, so they call it uh, DOMA. Uh, so this uh, uh, microservices architecture uh, takes that entire complexity of Uber, breaks it down into certain areas. So once you have uh, isolated, say, for example, Uber Eats from the rest of Uber, you can work out a sort of a domain for that, and then, and then you, you can you can uh, you know like build your integration ecosystem uh, within it. So it, it makes it somewhat easier, and you don't have people to deal with that entire complexity. So that 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 sort of helps reduce the uh, you know like uh, the uh, challenge of uh, uh, understanding integrations that existed um, in this entire ecosystem, but but still. Uh, if you want to put this into place, if you read the article uh, that they have written on this, um, you will find um, that there still needs to be something uh, to, to um, uh, glue all of these microservices um, uh, into one, one kind of a, you know, like a uh, aggregated uh, ecosystem. And then this is what they call this individual uh, domain. So, in order to do that, you will see that you need uh, sort of uh, high level abstractions, you will need support for protocols, you will need uh, integration uh, with uh, software as a service, especially if you are a cloud native um, uh, sort of a ecosystem, you will need to make use of the ecosystem services and um, those can sometimes be proprietary. Um, those can be based on older technology and then you find lots of requirements like this. So you cannot necessarily take a bunch of microservices and glue them together using uh, some kind of a you know, control plane ecosystem and assume that they will all fit perfectly well and work perfectly well without you having to do such a lot of additional work to achieve this kind of uh, ecosystem. Um, so, now I am trying to introduce uh, some of the ways of, of how an integration microservices architecture or a platform sort of uh, can, can help. Now, we have come up with uh, a sort of a micro integrator. Um, some of you might be familiar with this, which, which helps you do um, various things like service orchestration. You can compose services. You can do, um, you know, like a workflow sort of thing. You want to get choreography and then stuff running like that. Uh, you can work with uh, events. You can you can set up alerts and reactive systems, um, and and so and so forth. Um, so essentially, uh, we have provided a sort of a capability um, for you to use your microservices. I will get to that um, the, some of these examples in, in slides to come, uh, and and then we we give you capability that that you can very easily connect between these microservices and achieve exactly the same thing that you used to do with an ESV, uh, but not with an ESV, instead a set of micro uh, integration, um, uh, you know, like uh, services or, or integration uh, uh, microservices, which we call them. Um, and, and these integration microservices also natively supports uh, cloud ecosystems. Th that means, for example, you can deploy it in uh, Kubernetes or um, you can, you can uh, get them to run inside any other kind of container platform. Um, you can work with the SDKs that these things, uh, these platforms provide uh, to scale them up, scale them down, uh, to uh, sort of do uh, monitoring, tracing, all of that is available. So you, you really uh, can focus on your microservices alone and leave the sort of integration problem uh, to these integration microservices. And, and beyond that, uh, the integration patterns that, that you would want to use are still available again as integration microservices. So essentially what we are trying to do here is take your endpoints and make them much smarter. So like say you have uh, five microservices and you want to do aggregate something, you will add this aggregation uh, sort of a integration microservice into that ecosystem, connect all five together. And then you have a smart endpoint, which is the aggregated uh, service, which, which uh, is based on these five microservices that you previously had. Now, without an integration platform, you can achieve this, but that means you will have to write the logic yourself. You have to program the entire aggregation. This may be straightforward in some cases, of course, 
But if you are considering that any business will eventually keep growing, it will keep ad adding to this microservices ecosystem, you will obviously not get to the level of Uber, I don't think so, but uh, maybe you have, I don't know, uh, if, if it's a sufficiently large enterprise, um, um, uh, you may have uh, over 1K uh, uh, services uh, and then so and so forth. So I'm not trying to underestimate it uh, there, but um, it, it's 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 uh, it's a common thing that people would have, you know, maybe 10, 50, 100, um, I don't know, uh, more uh, services as you progress, as you get accustomed to using microservices, many people would just keep adding more and more microservices to this ecosystem. So if you're going to build all of these aggregations individually, um, there are situations where you may have focused on one kind of aggregation, but you have not focused on another kind of aggregation, or you want to change an aggregation to a, a sort of another sort of orchestration. You want to replace a pattern. You have to rewrite the entire thing. You have to keep updating it. So there's a lot of churn, which may happen in your microservices if you try to write them. So a platform uh, which gives you all of these components, give you, uh, uh, provides all of these building blocks. So you can replace one building block with another. Uh, you can easily switch them around. You can increase the level of aggregation. You can reduce it, whatever, right? That's, that's what it provides. And other things about resiliency and then so and so forth. So uh, one thing that if you're doing something like a service mesh, uh, it's very important that your infrastructure can, can support resiliency. That means if your service fails, if there is a, a connection um, delay or something like that, there has to be mechanisms to deal with it. Because uh, in this sort of like a semi-autonomous uh, operation, um, if, if one microservice fails in this chain, that means the entire system can, can come to a, you know, like a halt without you being able to even figure out what went wrong. And um, because when there are lots of them, um, uh, of course, there can be good tracing ecosystems or whatever to find uh, these kinds of faults and allow you to fix them. But if the services themselves are not resilient, uh, it will still take a hit. So with uh, sort of this uh, digital ecosystems these days, um, when you get what we call these integrated API supply chains, um, you cannot afford to fail like that. You, you, you have to be almost always up and running and you must consider the network is unreliable and you have to deal with it, right? Uh, so this is another thing that an integration platform uh, can, can offer, the, 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 the kind of resiliency uh, into your ecosystem. And of course, other things like uh, complex type conversions and all of these things, everything that you used to have in the, uh, the older ESP world, you still get it with integration microservices. Okay, so now I'll get to uh, a few of our features and then what we do with the latest release of Enterprise Integrator, uh, just to give you an idea of, of what these integration microservices are and how you can use them and, and all of these practical aspects and why you would need them more or less. Uh, so. Uh, one of the things that we um, actually do is, is that we, we give you sort of a unified product. So uh, you can do microservices integration, you can do centralized integration, you can do data streaming, um, you can use connectors and all of that. So you get one thing that can allow you to support all of these requirements. That means if you want to do a microservices integration, you got those capabilities. We support a microservices architecture and it, it, you, can, you can install it on uh, containers and so on and so forth. Uh, if you want to do an ESB style integration, we give you that as well. So you don't really need to uh, work with more than one vendor or install two different kinds of platforms. The same thing gives you both patterns and even more. So it can also do um, um, ETL or change data uh, sort of um, uh, requirements. And if you want to um, react on events or if you want to um, apply stream processing techniques, a platform, provides these things as well. So you have almost a, uh, a suite of, of uh, capabilities that, that you can use based on what kind of application requirements that you have. The benefit of this is, especially for those who have like these brownfield projects, it's very easy to keep running your legacy estate and then gradually transition into a microservice architecture. Without this kind of a transition, um, you will always find uh, downtime, you'll have challenges to deal with migrations and so on and so forth, right? So this simplifies these kinds of challenge a lot. Also, it gives you room for uh, moving into the future. Like for example, 
you might have seen like Uber keeps changing the way they explain microservices, for example, right? Uh, or if you go to another company like uh, Netflix says they did this for like five years and then they, and then they uh, like uh, gave up on it and now they're going with something else. Uh, so people come up with these kinds of things uh, all the time and then these architectures always evolve. And how do you, how do you um, uh, deal with this kind of uh, change and so and so forth. So a platform like this also gives you that flexibility because you you, uh, you can go from one style of integration into another style of integration. And, and to support all of that, we do have all of these visual tooling capabilities. So uh, the most recent release of Enterprise Integrator 7.1, we have sort of bumped up um, what uh, it provides. So if you haven't tried it, I, I, I would strongly recommend you go and uh, download it, give it a try. Uh, because the tooling especially has has uh, improved a lot. And then there's a lot of uh, additional drag and drop capabilities and things like this. And we also uh, provide you with now uh, integration uh, sort of uh, uh, layouts, like we have sort of these uh, templates, uh, which you can use based on your scenario. So if you want to just do something straightforward, you can, you can just uh, use one of these things, make a few changes, and then uh, it is ready to go. Um, we also um, uh, improved the way data transformation works, especially the, uh, the, the capabilities of the tool. The data mapper hasn't changed really. Um, so this is more or less uh, familiar functionality for you. Uh, but uh, the way it, it, it would integrate with um, uh, the rest of the ESP components and features, you might find a lot of uh, interesting changes there. So I would recommend that you try Enterprise Integrator 7.1. Um, and also, um uh, some of the uh, uh, other capabilities um, that it offers like uh, debugging and so and so forth uh, which might come in handy um, are, are, are sort of improved and enhanced uh, as well okay so uh, integration connectors this is another area that that um, i would like to highlight a little bit because uh, now, integration microservices are, are great ways of, um, uh, you know, connecting your own microservices. But what happens if you want to connect to a well-known external application, uh, like software as a service, because cloud services and things like this are, uh, you know, like very uh, prevalent these days in business. So you, you want to work with one of them. So we do have a series of connectors, and we, we've been updating them with every release. So you will find more and more connectors added to updated to cover more capability. And, and that's another area, I think, um, which, which makes this platform interesting because um, you, you have an option of working with external services without even having to worry about uh, their APIs or the evolution of their APIs and so on and so forth. So you work with a connector and bring that in as another component into your microservices ecosystem and, and, and that works in a straightforward way. So previously, connectors were components of an ESP, so it ran on this monolithic platform. Now it is distributed. And uh, lastly, uh, the sort of the, uh, the other interesting addition that we uh, have is, is this capability for you to program. Uh, so we, we figure that uh, sometimes uh, when it comes to enterprise integrations, people like to actually program it. Uh, and then the best way to do it is to sort of give you sort of a language uh, which you can very easily program your integration. So you can write microservices for your business logic. You can use uh, integration microservices to connect them based on standard patterns. But what if there was a requirement to tune it a little bit, customize the integration that you want to do so and so forth. So this is where uh, our uh, programming uh, language approach comes. And I would um, suggest that you try uh, Ballerina if you haven't tried it yet. Uh, it's a very interesting language. It's a language that was purpose-built for enterprise integration, the first of its kind. Uh, and I would, I would um, suggest that you give it a try as well if you haven't. And all of this, I think, gives you that complete uh, solution that you're looking for uh, in this integration space. Um, and then that's, that's, that's what um, sort of uh, we advocate and then um, uh, sort of explain uh, in terms of how you should uh, build your integration and so on and so forth with these integration microservices. And, and all of this, I think, uh, would obviously help you uh, achieve that. Uh, 